Good day, everyone. Welcome to Work, Study, and Management. We are going to discuss Chapter 8, which is the Workplace and System Safety. Here we have our topic outline with nine parts, starting with Part 1, which is the Basic Philosophies of Accident Causation and Prevention, with its subtopics, Domino Theory, and Behavior-Based Safety Models. Part 2, we have Accident Prevention Process, and under it is the topics Identifying the Problem, Collect and Analyze Data, Job Safety Analysis, Select a Remedy, Risk Analysis and Decision Making, and Monitoring and Accident Statistics. Part 3 is all about Probability Methods, Part 4, Reliability, Part 5 is the fault tree analysis, wherein the cost-benefit analysis topic will be discussed. Part 6, we have safety legislation and workers' compensation. The basics and terminology and the workers' compensation will be discussed in this part. Part 7 is the occupational safety and administration, or the OSHA, with its subtopics OSHA Act, workplace inspections, citations, and the OSHA ergonomics program. Part 8 is the hazard control. Lastly, we have part 9, which is the general housekeeping. So before proceeding to the main topics, let us first run through the key points that we must remember to help us understand this discussion more. Starting with the question, where or why do accidents result from? Accidents result from a sequence of events with multiple causes. Next is to examine accidents by using job safety analysis. Job safety analysis is a procedure which helps integrate accepted safety and health principles and practices into an operation. Third is to detail the accident sequence or system failure by using the fall tree analysis. Next is to increase system reliability by adding backups and increasing component reliability. Then consider trade-offs of various corrective actions by using cost-benefit analysis. We have be familiar with OSHA safety requirements or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration that was created to assure that every working man and woman in the nation is safe and has a good health working conditions to preserve our human resources. Lastly, for the key points, we have to control hazards by six processes. First, eliminating the hazards completely if possible. But if it's not possible, we can control hazards through limiting the energy levels involved using isolation, barriers and interlocks, designing fail-safe equipment and systems, and we can control hazards through minimizing failures, through increased reliability, safety factors, and monitoring. So controlling hazards is very important in the workplace. Why? It is to reduce the risk of accidents and to maintain a safe workplace environment. So speaking of safe workplace, let us define what workplace safety is. Workplace safety is an extension of the concept of providing a good, safe, comfortable working environment for the operator or the workers. It is important part of any job that requires everyone in the company or to adhere to the safety guidelines and policies in place. So the worker workplace safety's primary goal is to decrease the number of accidents that potentially can lead to injuries and loss of property. Basically, it is to provide a safe environment for the workers. So how can we achieve workplace safety? Management can provide protocols that the workers must strictly follow to limit the risk of accidents. So for example, the management can give safety guidelines and policies for the workers to follow before, during, and after doing an operation. So let us formally start part one, which is the basic philosophies of accident causation and prevention. To start, let us define accident prevention and compare it to safety management. 
Accident prevention is a tactical, relatively short-term approach to controlling workers, materials, tools, and equipment in the workplace for the purpose of reducing or preventing the occurrence of accidents. This approach solely focuses on the tangible parts of the workplace, the men, the tools and equipment, machines and materials, whereas safety management is the long-term approach to increase safety within the whole company or the area. Accident prevention is under the safety management. It includes the overall planning, education, and training, and those that was learned in safety management will then be applied in accident prevention. So we're, here we have the accident prevention process or flow process. First is to identify the problem in a clear and logical form, focusing mainly on the problem that was the cause of the accident. After the problem is identified, a safety engineer will collect the data as to why the problem occurred and what caused it to happen. The data will then be analyzed to understand the root cause of the accident and to identify possible remedies to prevent it. Among those remedies that is being laid out, the safety engineer will select the best approach or remedy. But it doesn't have to completely prevent the accident to happen, but at least to reduce the effects or severity of the accident. The safety engineer will then implement it. After the remedy is implemented, it should be monitored <coughs> to see if it is really effective. But there are instances when the remedy that was being implemented will tend to fail for some underlying factors, causing it to be ineffective in preventing the problem to happen again. When that happens, the safety engineer will have to start the cycle again but this time with another remedy that they think is best. That is why it will be a continuous cycle and then until the best remedy will be found. In identifying the problem, it is important to understand some of the theories of accident causation and the sequence of steps in an accident itself. One theory developed by Heinrich Peterson and Drews in 1980 is the domino theory. So we all know how dominoes work, right? It is a series of chain reaction wherein once the first domino will fall, the rest will follow. So in the domino theory, when one factor that can cause accident was failed to prevent, every other factor will fall continuously, resulting from the last domino, which is the injury. First domino or first cause is the lack of control. It is the first in the sequence because it is essentially the lack of a properly implemented or maintained safety program. So if those elements or factors were not followed, there is a high risk of accidents to occur. Let us start with number four, that is the second block of the domino that will fall after the lack of control. So number four is the basic causes result from an overall lack of control or proper management. Number three, the immediate causes result from more basic causes. A, the unsafe acts from personal factors such as lack of knowledge, skill, or simply the lack of motivation or care. After basic causes, immediate causes will fall next because since there is no proper management in the basic causes, workers may tend to lack knowledge or skill to do what they are asked to and often just comply to do the job without really knowing what he or she did is wrong or right or without following the proper guidelines. So B, the unsafe conditions due to job factors such as inadequate work standards, wear and tear, poor working conditions due to either the environment or lack of maintenance. Basically B is all about the workplace. So without proper management or lack of maintenance, unsafe conditions in the workplace will also be a factor of a risk in accidents. So we cannot proceed to two. After immediate causes, accidents will result from it. So such as unsafe acts by people and the unsafe conditions in the workplace. Then 
what results accidents. So, of course, the last domino to fall is the injury, which is the effect of all the improper doings or factors that was stated from the start of the domino up until the accident happens. So, how can we prevent accidents to happen? Just like how we will want to stop the dominoes from falling in a chain reaction manner, we can just simply remove one of the previous dominoes, thereby preventing the rest from falling. So the domino theory emphasizes that it is very important to try to remove a domino as far upstream as possible, meaning we should eliminate a domino that is nearest to the source to prevent far more negative things to happen. So for example, our source is the lack of control. So we can prevent or we can remove the basic causes or the second domino so that the immediate causes, accident and injury will not happen. As an adaptation of the domino theory, Heinrich, Peterson and Bruce also emphasized the concept of multiple causation, wherein it states that behind each accident or injury, there may be numerous contributing factors, causes, and conditions. It might be difficult to identify which of the factors was the very major cause, so rather than trying to find just one major cause, it would be best to try to identify and control as many causes as possible so that in the future, if accidents will happen for such a certain cause or factor, we can already know how to prevent it and to get the biggest overall effect on preventing the accident sequence. 88% of all accidents are caused by the unsafe acts by human. So here are five factors. First is the horseplay or when the workers will fool around during working hours. It can also be when the workers operate the equipment improperly or the workers are working under the influence of drugs, purposefully negating safety devices, not stopping a machine before cleaning or removing stock piece. Among unsafe conditions, there are 10% of all accidents that can result from it. It can be inadequate guards, inadequate lighting, or it is very hard to operate a certain machine or workpiece or producing a product if we cannot see clearly because there is inadequate lighting. It can also be defective tools or equipment, inadequate ventilation. Because of inadequate ventilation, machines may tend to overheat and poorly designed machines or workplace. So here is an example wherein the domino theory and the multiple causation is being applied. So in the lack of control, the causes are solvent stored at grinder or poor identification of work activities. If lack of control will fall, then the basic causes with the multiple causation of less volatile solvent and the grinder creates sparks. So as the grinder creates sparks, immediate causes will then follow wherein the sparks that was created by the grinder will ignite fumes and when that fumes can create explosion or fire which is the accident and when an accident happens the operator will be injured causing burns on his body so how can we prevent it to happen so in between lack of control and basic causes we can separate the gas to the grinder and there should be a better inspection so that when the grinder creates sparks, the grinder that was used should be stopped immediately. In between the basic causes and immediate causes, we can increase the ventilation so that there will be no fumes that is created. And the grinder material should also be seen. In between immediate causes and accident, there should be a spark arrester that when the grinder creates sparks, it can minimize it to create fumes. And when an accident happens, 
an injury will be prevented if the operator will have or will wear fire protective suit. Next is the accident ratio triangle still by Heinrich, Peterson, and Roos on 1980. It establishes the foundation for a major injury, emphasizes the necessity of moving backward in the accident projection sequence. First triangle is the Heinrich accident ratio triangle, wherein it states that for each major injury, most likely there are at least 29 minor injuries and 300 no injury accidents with untold hundreds or thousands of unsafe acts leading up to the base of the triangle. So this triangle can help the safety engineer to foresee which he or she should focus to prevent. So the safety engineer should focus on the no injury accidents rather than just one major injury so that there are a total loss control to accidents to happen. Then the high reach accident ratio triangle was then later modified by Bird and Germain in 1985 in which they include property damage and revise the numbers but still the thought or the basic philosophy remained the same. So in Bird and Germain accident ratio triangle, it states that for one major injury, there are 10 minor injuries, 30 property damage, and 600 near misses or no injury accidents. So in this triangle, the safety engineer will have to focus on the base of the triangle to control accidents to happen or preventing the accidents to happen. Next, we have the behavior-based safety models. The basis for this approach lies in early crisis research of Hill in 1949, followed by the quantification of these crises or more modest situational factors into life change units or the LCUs by Holmes and Rye in 1967. By the way, life change units are the negative events that may happen in our life that can create higher stress levels. So behavior-based safety models are the, the basic premise of this theory is that situational factors tax a person's capacity to cope with stress in the workplace, leaving the person more likely to suffer an accident as the amount of stress increases. So the higher the worker's stress is, the capacity of it to cause or to suffer an accident. So this theory may help explain apparently accident-prone individuals and the need for having stressless workers avoid difficult or dangerous tasks. Here is a table of life change units wherein life events are provided and is ranked from 1 to 43. The lower the rank is, the higher the mean value. For example, in rank 1, death to spouse, it has the highest mean value of 100. So, uh, for example, in a situation wherein in a year, a worker has suffered a death of spouse, which has a mean value of 100, and change in the financial state with a mean value of 38. So the higher the worker suffers from stress, the more they are likely to create accident in the workplace. So what the management will do is that they prevent the them to, to do a difficult task to prevent accidents to happen. And for those workers who have low stress levels, they can perform those difficult tasks. In instances wherein the worker who has the task to do a difficult job has high stress level, then the management can find an alternative worker. But a cross training should be done first so that they will know how to operate the task. Next model is the motivation reward satisfaction model. 
It is still presented by Heinrich, Peterson, and Bruce. It expands on the Skinnerian concepts of positive reinforcement to achieve certain goals. Worker performance is dependent on the worker's motivation as the worker's ability to perform in terms of safety. So the factors, job climate, self, the job itself, job motivational factors, peer groups and unions are pointing in the word motivation. So when these factors are positive, then the higher the motivation of the worker. And in that positive effect, the better the worker performs. So the better the worker performs the task, the better the reward is. And the more the worker is satisfied from the reward, the greater the worker's motivation to perform better. So it is a continuous cycle, which is a positive approach in which it applies that motivation is an important factor for the worker to perform his or her job better. And since he can perform better and is highly motivated, the lower the risk of accidents. Lastly, we have the ABC model. It is the most current and popular variation of behavior-based safety training. The A in the word ABC model stands for the antecedents or the events that take place before the behavior occurs. B stands for the behavior or what the worker does as part of the accident sequence. C is the consequence. It is the events taking place after the behavior leading to a potential accident and injury. To understand more, I have an example wherein in the antecedent is that the worker is done for his work and is now ready to take lunch. The behavior is that he wants to arrive to the canteen faster to have a long break. So he decided to take a shortcut. Instead of walking in a proper and safe way or lane, he took a shortcut in a lane with moving conveyor trucks. So the consequence of his behavior is that he may be hit by the moving truck and injury may happen. So that is the ABC model and it focuses more on the negative consequences if the behavior is also negative. Behavior-based approaches are quite effective as an accident prevention method. Considering the majority of the causes of accident in human is human acts with a total percent of 88. Unfortunately, this approach focuses solely on people and not on physical hazards. So it is still very important that we take we bear in mind that we should make procedures for workplace to ensure workplace safety. And that is all for my report. And Blanco will report next for part two. Hi, so let's move on to the accident prevention process. Okay, so the accident prevention process has six steps. So for first one is identifying the problem, second and third collecting and analyzing the data, fourth and fifth selecting a remedy, risk analysis and decision making, and the last one is monitoring and accident statistics. Okay, so identifying the date, the problem. So this is the first step in the accident prevention process. Now there are various tools that we can make use to identify whether one department is significantly more hazardous than the other. So today we'll be focusing on the chi-square analysis. So this is the formula for the chi-square analysis. So it's, a, it's x squared is equal to summation of the difference of the expected value minus the observed value squared over the expected value. So these are the values that we need to take note of. So expected value, observed value, total of observed values, hours work, total of hours work, number of areas compared. So if the resulting x squared is greater than the x squared at an error level of a, and then m minus one, the critical level x squared at an error level of a, 
and with m minus one degrees of freedom. So and then there is a significant difference between the expected and observed values in injuries. Okay, so here's an example using the chi-square analysis of injury data. Okay, so Durbin Co has three main production departments. It has processing, assembly, and packing or shipping. So it is concerned with the apparent high number of injuries in processing and would like to know if this is a significant deviation from the rest of the plan. So chi-square analysis comparing the number of injuries in 2006 with an expected number based on the number of exposure hours is the appropriate way to study the problem. So the expected number of injuries in processing is found from. So it is shown here. For us to get the expected like number of injuries, we need to get the expected value usage. So it's numbers of hours worked and then the total observed values and then divided by the hours worked, total hours worked. Okay. As he have mentioned here, when computing the, the number of injuries or total number of injuries and comparing it using the chi-square analysis, it is imperative to use the number of exposure hours, so how long they're exposed to the risk. So for us to get the expected value, which is the, which is the IE, so here is a computation right here. So 900,000 multiplied by 36 divided by 2,900,000, that's 11.2. So this is the expected. And then this is the observed. And then this is the total hours, our work. Okay. Now. Observe and expected injuries. As mentioned there, there, there is a high injury level in the processing. So we are trying to compare it with the rest so that we can see if there is really a high like injury in the processing. So the expected numbers of injuries for the other departments are found similarly. So this is assembly, observed injuries, and then the expected injury is 7.4 and this is the exposure hours same with packing and shipping with observed injury of 4 exposure hour of h and with an expected injury of e i mean of 7.4 so overall there is a total of 36 observed injury and exposure hours of 2,900,000 and expected injuries of 36 so using the formula of the guy square analysis we can get 15.1. Now this, the resultant value of 15.1 is greater than the x squared found in table 8.3. So therefore, the number of injuries in at least one department deviates significantly from the expected value based purely on exposure hours. So when we are basing this or the chi square analysis on the exposure hours, we can really see that the processing has a higher risk and a high number of injury. As you can see here, he has a low exposure hour compared to assembly. However, it's expected injury is 11.2, but like the injuries observed surpassed the expected injury by half. And that is a lot basing from the exposure hours, which is much lesser than the assembly. Next is collecting and analyzing the data. So this is the second and third step in the accident prevention process. And the most common and basic tool for this is the job safety analysis, analysis or the GSA. So sometimes also termed job hazard analysis or method safety analysis. Now there are major factors that the safety engineer should focus in collecting and analyzing the data. Which one is the worker, second is the method, machine and material. So this is an example of a job hazard analysis. So as you can see, you can view the key job steps, potential health and injury hazard and safe practices, apparel and equipment being used. 
So next is the select a remedy risk analysis and decision making. So this is the fourth and fifth step in the accident prevention process or the GSA. So GSA have been completed and variety of solutions have been suggested. The safety engineer will need to choose one for implementation. Okay, so now a tool that can be used is risk analysis. It is more suitable for safety because it calculates the potential, the potential loss, increase, likelihood or probability that the hazardous event will occur, increased exposure to the hazardous conditions, and increased possible consequences of the hazardous event. So these are risk analysis factor values we need to take note that the values here are arbitrary. When we say arbitrary, this is based only on the whim of the safety engineer, like what he deems appropriate to put there, then there is no basis actually, but just the whim of the safety engineer. Okay. So as you can see, here we can see the likelihood, exposure, and the possible consequences being rated by the safety engineer. This is also the risk analysis and cost effectiveness. So same with the last one, the values here are arbitrary and these are just, for example, the safety engineer deems the situation very high risk as discontinue, and we have to discontinue the operation. This value here is based also by the safety engineer's whim. So if he deems it, it's high risk and immediate correction, then he sees that it's between 200 to 400, the value is 200 to 400, then that's it. So lastly is the monitoring and accident statistics. Now this is the final step in the accident prevention process. So this step is basically monitoring and evaluating the effectiveness of the new method, getting feedback and starting the cycle again. So after the first until the fifth step, so we have, we have gathered data and we have analyzed it. So now we, have, we are to monitor accident statistics, okay? For us to see if the method that we really did is effective and just get feedback for us to start all over again, because as we all know, there is always room for improvement. And if you're implementing a new method after a period of time, you have to evaluate it and see if it really works and what changes you can make to make it all the more better. So typically numerical data provide a solid benchmark for monitoring any changes. So this could be insurance costs, medical costs, simply numbers of injuries and or accidents. So however, any of these numbers should be normalized to the worker exposure hours so that the numbers can be compared across location and industries. As I have mentioned before, we are basing all of this in the exposure hours since how long a worker is exposed to those risks really we need to take note of that okay so osha recommends express expressing injury statistics as incidence rate so per 100 full-time employees per year now this is the formula for the incidence rate which is 200,000 multiplied by the number of injuries in given time period divided by the employee hours work in the same time period. Okay, so for OSHA record keeping purposes, the injuries should be OSHA recordable. So when we say OSHA recordable, they should be in numbers. So more than simple first aid injuries. However, research has shown that there are considerable similarities between minor and major injuries. So similarly, the severity rate monitors the number of loss time or days. So for OSHA, record keeping purposes, injuries should be recordable as I've said before. So this is the formula for the severity rate, which is 200,000 multiplied by the lost time divided by the hours of work on the same period of time by the worker. So yeah, that's about it. So we will move on to the next chapter. Thank you for listening. Hi, good morning. My name is Eduardo Buok and I will be continuing to report a subtopic in Chapter 8, which is the Workplace and Systems Safety. So, uh, um, lately, since um, I have already uh, discussed and reported this 
in um in a class but uh, but unfortunately i wasn't able to re to record it so right now i will go into um discuss it to you sir again and now i will be discussing to you the probability methods so Accident causation models discussed previously, especially the domino theory, implied a very de deterministic response. So since we've already discussed, or my previous member discussed about the um, domino theory, and of course one of, my, of our members have discussed to you the way on how to solve and how to co um, compute how many people have injured, or the formula to compute that. So there are three operators that define interactions between events. The first one is the interaction, or also called as end, the interaction between two events with symbol intersection or a dot. Sometimes the dot is being um, omitted or removed. The second one is or, the union between events with U, which means, which means union, of course, symbol or plus or positive. The third is the not, the negation of an event with symbol minus. Now, the interaction of two two events x and y, variables x and y, using these operators follows a specific pattern termed the truth tables. Interactions between more than two events result in more complicated expressions, which necess necessitate an ordered processing to evaluate resulted over probability of the final accident or injury. Now, the specific order or, or precedence that must be followed is as follows. Also, certain groupings of events tend to appear repeatedly so that if one recognizes these patterns, simplification rules can be applied to quicken the evaluation process. Procedure. So on the table, as you can see, there are two different tables or formulas or uh, solution. The first one is the, the Boolean truth tables. The second one is the Boolean algebra simplifications. Now they they are different in one another because, as you can see. Um, the Boolean algebra simplification is a bit is a bit complicated because it shows how to solve step by step. It shows um, a, a series of uh, variables. It seems it's being compl uh, computed and solved. While the Boolean truth tables is just put there the uh, variables and in their in their respective places. Now, that's the. Uh, I will be discussing to you the independent and not independent events. Well, this is basically um, uh, the um, the next chapter, so I'm going to skip this. I mean, it's the next topic that I'm going to discuss since um, there were some issues, uh, problems in this, the slide. So I'm just going to skip this one. All right. So in uh, I'll let me just go ahead and, and um, look for that a specific. Okay, in a series of arrangement, every component must succeed for total system T to succeed. This can be expressed at, as the intersection of all components. T is equals to A intersection or intersect to B. Intersect to C, which is A, B, C, which, if independent in most cases, yields a, prob a probability of P of T equals to P of A times P of B times P of C, or if not independent or independent in other way, yields P of T is equals to P times A, P times B over A. P times C over AB. In a parallel arrangement, the total system succeeds if any one component succeeds. This can be expressed as a union of the component T is equal to A, union of B, union of C equals to A plus B plus C. Now, on the table, 
it will be differentiate or you will be able to differentiate you, you yourself the di um, differences the series system as you can see um, it's just one straight um, series system ABC and that comes out T equals ABC while the parallel system on the other hand has a different way of system though in the end it's um, it has um, I mean I mean on the picture it has a arrows uh, that has same with the series but the way of, of it being um, uh, composed is different as you can see um, the arrows so let's let's begin with the variables of course so a b and c but they are they are all going on the same direction but on the i mean they're all going on the uh, or they're all going to end on the same um, way but they are all going on a different direction so a and then uh, turn and then b is straight and that's that gives you t is equal to a plus b plus c which if which if mutually exclusive typically yields a probability of p of t equals to 1 minus 1 minus p times a times 1 minus p times c now we are i will be discussing to you the rel reliability of two stage amplifier well this is another this is already on the on the next topic okay right remember the uh, um uh, the plane okay this one so let, let's move on to the next topic which is the reliability so this is the next subtopic that i will discuss to you 8.4 chapter 8 8.4 reliability the definition of that is um, a, a system could be either a physical product or with physical components or, or an operational procedure with a sequence of steps or sub operations that need to be completed correctly for the for the procedure to succeed these components or steps can be arranged in, co in combinations using two different basic relationships series and parallel arrangement so um, basically um, it's it's completely saying that there is a way and um, different sub operations that needs to be completed and also um, components that has two different basic relationships which has i've already been discussed to you earlier now uh, as an example i will be uh, trying uh, I, will, I will try to to uh, okay now this is the first um um relationship which is the, the reliability of a four engine airplane so consider an, air, an airplane with four independent but identical engines the airplane can obviously fly with all four engines working with any three engines working and also with two engines working as long as there is one engine working on each side of the plane that is two engines working on one side would cause the plane to be unbalanced as to crash so what is the overall reliability of the of the airplane given that the given that the reliability of each engine is 0 0.9 now here is the solution that a um a, a sample of reliability solution now let's just let's take this step by step so four engines let's let, let's take a b c d as the um variables now for the for the three engines variables it's a b c plus a b d plus b c d plus a c d now it's already been mix up, mixed up and uh, um, distributed it's because it's um it's three engines it's it's already a different way of uh, uh, a of probability now the two engines is a c plus a d 
plus BC plus BD. If you're going to sum them up all together, that will give you T is equals to ABCD, which is the four engine, plus ABC, which is in three engines, plus ABD, plus BCD, plus ACD, plus, let's jump into two engines, AC, plus AD, plus BC, plus BD. The expression must be simplified. And the three engines, three engines combinations are um, redundant to the two engine combinations, which is the AC plus AC plus ABC is equals to AC times A1 plus B equals to AC. Similarly, the four engine combination is redundant to any of the two engine combinations, resulting in the final expression for system reliability of T is equals to AC plus AD plus BC plus BD. So T is equals to A plus B times CD. The probability of each expression on in parentheses is P is equals to, I mean P time. P of A plus B equals P times A or P of A plus P of B minus P of A times P of B is equals to that gives you 0 0.9 plus 0 0.9 minus 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 and that completely gives us 0 0.99 and the total system reliability becomes P of T which which is or which the formula has already given us earlier in the discussion which is a P of T is equals to 0 0.99 times 0 0.99 and that also completely give us 0 0.9801. Now it's it's um, understood that the uh, engines of the plane has four, which is the A, A B C D. So that gives us also A B C T is equals to A B C D plus A B C plus A B D plus B C D plus A C D plus A C plus AD, plus BC, and plus BD. Alright, so that's it. Thank you so much for um, listening. Once again, my name is Edward Book, and I thank you for um, giving me a score of 92, sir. So have a great day, sir, and take care of yourself, and see you soon. So, full tree analysis. Fault tree analysis is another approach that examines accident sequences or system failures. Also, this is a probabilistic deductive process using a graphical model or parallel and sequential combinations of events or faults leading to overall and desired event. So, fault tree analysis was developed in 1962 by Bell Telephone Laboratories to assist the U.S. Air Force in examining missiles failure and later used by NASA to ensure overall system safety for the manned space program. And it has been used since then a lot. So these are the different symbols of a fault tree structure. In general, there are two main categories, default events and the basic events. So first, top event or the intermediate event. So these events are fault events that needs to be evaluated further and it is identified by a rectangle. And the next one is the basic events. So this event is found at the bottom of a fault tree and cannot be developed any further. So this event is identified by a circle. So next is the normal event. It is identified by a house-shaped symbol, and normal event are those events that is expected to occur. So the next event is the undeveloped event. So these are the events that is inconsequential or does not have any sufficient information for further development. So these events are linked with gates that involves the same Boolean logic, which was discussed from the other section. So these are the gates of a fault tree, the AND gate and the OR gate. The AND gate serves to indicate that all input events are required in order to cause to output event, while the OR gate 
serves to indicate that one or more of the input events are required to produce the gated event. So this is the basic fault tree structure. As you can see here, the two main categories of fault events, which is the top event and the intermediate events. Also, you can see here the basic events at the bottom and the logic gates. So example, the grinding shop of Dorben Corporation has had several relatively small fires that were quickly put out. However, the company is concerned that a fire could get out of control and burn down the whole plant. So one way to analyze the problem is to use the fall tree approach with the major fire as the head event. So our head event is the plant burns down. In order to create a fault tree structure, the second thing you need to do is to determine the events that contributes to the top event. So the events that contributes to plant burns down are the combustibles, ignition, and the fire out of control. And there could be several sources in ignition. So one of these is when an operator smokes in spite of no smoking signs. So next is sparks coming from a grinding wheel and the last one is when there is an electrical short in the grinder so here in the first set of events the combustible ignition and the fire out of control it is connected with an and gate since all of the events are required and for the ignition set of event any one input is sufficient for ignition to occur so that is why it is connected with an or gate so an alternate approach would be to draw a sequence of events similar to components for a product or operations for a system as shown below. So here, same example but different illustration since the other approach we use is the fault tree structure. So in this figure, the three main events, the combustibles, ignition, and fire getting out of control are drawn in series since the path must go through all of the three to have a plant burn down. So the ignition sources can be considered in parallel, the smoking, sparks, and short, since the path has only to go through any one of them to have an ignition. So to calculate the total probability of plant burn down, we need to calculate the total probability of the ignition, since here we already have the probability of the combustible, which is 0.8 and the probability of fire getting out of control which is 0.1 so to calculate the total probability of the ignition it is equals to b equals b1 plus b2 plus b3 so probability of b is equals to 1 minus the quantity of 1 minus the probability of b1 times the quantity of 1 minus the probability of b2 times 1 minus the probability of B3. So substitute, which is equals to 1 minus the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.01 times the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.05 times the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.02 which is equals to 0 0.0783. So you may ask, where did I get 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0 0.02? So 0 0.01 is the probability of smoking, which is B1. And the 0 0.05 is the probability of sparks, which is B2. And 0 0.02 is the probability of short, which is B3. So the total probability of ignition is 0 0.0783. So now we can calculate the total probability of the plant burned down. So the total probability of the plant burned down is equals to A times B times C. So substitute probability of A is equals to 0 0.8 times the probability of B is equals to 0 0.0783 times the probability of C is equals to 0 0.1 which is equals to 0 0.0063. So meaning there is an approximately 0.6% chance of a plant burn down. So next is the cost-benefit analysis. Cost-benefit analysis is a type of analysis in which the total expected costs are weighed against the total expected benefits for one or more interventions in order to choose the best or most profitable option. So note that the cost part is easy to understand. 
for it is simply the money being spent to retrofit an old machine to purchase a new machine or a safety device meaning to install or put new parts in an old machine so the benefit part is a bit more difficult to understand since it is typically a reduction in accident cost or a lost production cost or money saved in reduced injuries and medical cost over a period of time so example full tree and cost benefit analysis of a coffee mill finger lacerations so with the rise in popularity of specialty coffees many consumers have purchased coffee mills in order to grind their own coffee beans for fresher coffee so as a result there has been an increase of finger lacerations from the rotor blade due to the inadvertent activation of the coffee mill with fingers still in the mill so possible contributing factors to such an accident and injury are shown in the fault tree in figure 8.19 with estimated probabilities for each event so the circuit closed could be due to abnormal closure or the switch closed so that is why it is connected with an or gate so for the abnormal closure it could be due to variety of conditions so such as broken wire conductive debris wired incorrectly or moisture across path and for the switch closed it it could be due to fails in closed position switch closed normally or switch assemble closed so that is why it is connected with an or gate so to calculate the total probability of the rotor cuts finger we need to calculate first the probability of the abnormal closure so it is shown here as the probability of c1 so the probability of c1 is equals to 1 minus the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.001 times the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.01 times the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.001 times the quantity of 1 minus 0 0.01 which is equals to 0 0.0199 so you may ask where did I get the 0 0.001, 0 0.1, 0 0.01 and the 0 0.1 so the 0 0.001 is the broken wire and the 0 0.1 is the probability of the conductive debris and the 0 0.01 is the probability of moisture across path and the 0 0.01 is the probability of wired incorrectly so next we need to calculate the total probability of switch closed so it is illustrated here as the probability of c2 so the probability of c2 is equals to 1 minus the quantity of 1 minus the probability of fails in closed position which is 0 0.001 times the quantity of 1 minus the probability of switch closed normally which is 0 0.01 times 1 minus the quantity of 1 minus the probability of switch assemble closed which is 0 0.001 so the total probability of switch closed is equals to 0 0.1 so now we can calculate the total probability of circuit closed so the total probability of circuit closed is equals to 1 minus the quantity of 1 minus the probability of abnormal closure which is 0 0.0199 times the quantity of 1 minus the probability of switch closed which is 0 0.1 which is equals to 0 0.12 so the total probability of the circuit closed is 0 0.12 so next we need to calculate the total probability of the rotor in motion so the probability of rotor in motion is equals to probability of circuit closed times the power connected so substitute probability of b is equals to 0 0.12 times the power connected which is 1 is equals to 0 0.12 so the total probability of rotor in motion is equals to 0 0.12 so now we can calculate the total probability of rotor cuts finger so the probability of rotor cuts finger is equals to probability of a which is equals to rotor in motion times the probability of finger in path of the rotor which is equals to 0 0.12 times 0 0.2 is equals to 0 0.024 
So the next part is to examine the alternative redesigns and safety measures to reduce the likelihood of incurring a finger injury. So an interlock switch in the covers of the coffee mill is the redesign found on most of the coffee mills. However, the other failure modes could still occur and the probability of the head event would not go completely to 0, 0.0 but instead reduces to 0 0.0048 with a new criticality of 0 0.96 dollars the resulting decrease in criticalities from 4.80 dollars to 0 0.96 dollars is a benefit of 3.84 dollars but there is an increased associated cost of approximately one dollar per coffee meal so therefore the cost benefit ratio is c divided by b is equals to one dollar divided by 3.84 which is the benefit is equals to 0 0.26 so an alternative cheaper approach could be to apply a warning sticker to the side of the coffee meal stating that always disconnect power before removing the coffee or cleaning the bowl so it has the cost of 0 0.10 per meal so the probability of a power connected event would be reduced perhaps to 0 0.3 but not to 0, 0.0 because consumers will be likely to forget or ignore the warning but the resulting probability of the head event is reduced to 0 0.0072 and the criticality to $1.44. So the new benefit is $3.36 yielding a cost benefit ratio of 0 0.10 divided by 3.36 is equals to 0 0.03. So this approach on the surface appears to be much more cost effective. However, the probability of power connected is probably greatly underpredicted, as most consumers will forget to unplug the power before entering the bowl. So therefore, this would not be the preferred solution. So take note that if an additional $1 were applied to each meal for additional quality control to catch all the wiring and switch errors before shipping, reducing each of those probabilities to 0, 0.0, the resulting cost-benefit ratio at 1.25 is much larger than the installation of the interlock switch in the cover, meaning the use of interlock is much more preferred solution compared to applying a warning sticker on the side of the coffee mill stating that always disconnect power before removing coffee or cleaning the bowl. Part 6 is all about safety legislations and workers compensation. So let's start in basic terminologies. In the United States, safety legislations as well as the rest of the legal system is based on a combination of common law, statute law, and administrative law. Common law was derived from the unwritten customs and typical usage in England, but adjusted and interpreted by the courts through judicial decisions. Statute law is written law enacted by legislators and enforced by the executive branch. And administrative law is established by the executive branch or government agencies. However, since common law came first, many of our legal terms and principles are derived from that. Thus, the ancient terms of master, servant, stranger eventually came to represent employer employee and guest or visitor respectively so liability liability is the obligation to provide compensation for damages or injury while strict liability is a higher level of liability in which the plaintiff need to prove negligence or fault Plaintiff is the person typically injured originating a suit in court, and the defendant is the entity defending in the suit, typically an employer or the manufacturer of a product, while the negligence is the failure to exercise a reasonable amount of care in preventing injury. 
Higher form of negligence include gross negligence with failure to show the slightest care and negligence per se with no proof needed. Any resulting awards to the plaintiff fall into two categories. These are the compensatory and punitive damages. When we say compensatory damages for medical cost, lost wages, and other direct losses on the part of the plaintiff, and punitive damages in the form of additional monetary amounts specifically to punish the defendant. So, under the English common law system and later under the statute law, the employer did have some legal obligations to provide a safe workplace, protect employees against injury, and pay for injuries and damages that could result if the employer failed to fulfill those obligations. These obligations also extended to customers and the general public, for example, visitors to the workplace. However, in practice, these legal obligations didn't amount too much as the burden of proof fell on the worker to prove in court that the employer's negligence had been the sole cause of his or her injury. So, there are several factors made it especially difficult for the employee to prove his or her case. First is the Doctrine of privacy, privacy required a direct relationship, as in, in the form of contract, between the two contesting parties. Therefore, any workers not having a direct contract with the employer would likely have little success in court. Secondly, the assumption of risk concept implied that a worker who was aware of the hazards of the job but continued working there, assumed the risk and could not recover damages in case of injury even though it occurred through no fault of his or her own. The third one is the fellow employee negligence or contributory negligence by the worker himself or herself severely limited the worker's case. Finally, there was always the fear of loss of jobs for the worker or fellow employees which generally restricted legal actions against employers. In any legal action took many years, delaying the compensation needed for medical expenses and result in consistent and relatively insufficient compensation, with much of the money going to the lawyers involved. So as a result, there arose demands for workers' compensations, legislations that could, would correct these inequities and force employers to take corrective action to safeguard their employees. So let's move on to workers' compensation. In the United States, the first workers' compensation laws were enacted in 1908 for federal employees and eventually were enacted in all 50 states and the U.S. territories. These all operate on the general principle of recompensing workers' medical expenses and lost wages without establishing fault. Approximately 80% of the U.S. workforce is covered, with some notable exceptions, independent agriculture, agricultural workers, domestic workers, some charity organizations, railroad and maritime workers, and smaller independent contractors. In order to ensure that worker benefits do not end if the employer were to go bankrupt, companies are required to obtain insurance. This could be on an exclusive basis through state funds set up for this purpose or a competitive basis through a private insurance companies. So, there are three main requirements for a worker to claim compensation. These are, first is the injury must have resulted from an accident. Second is the injury must have arisen out of employment. Third is the injury must have occurred during the course of employment. So, injuries not considered accidents include those caused by intoxication, those that are self-inflected, 
or those that arose out of a heated argument. Also, anything that could have occurred normally, such as heart attack, would not be covered unless the work were considered so stressful as to be contributing to the heart attack. Injuries arising out of employment apply to works assigned by a supervisor or work normally expected of that employee. Uh, a typical exception that would negate compensation is doing government work or using company equipment for personal use. And injuries during the course of employment apply to normal work hours only and not to commuting time to and from work unless the company provides transport transportation. So, workers' compensation is typically broken down into four categories of disability, namely the temporary partial disabilities, temporary total disabilities, permanent partial disabilities, and permanent total disabilities. So, when we say temporary partial disabilities, are ones in which the worker receives minor injury and full recovery is ex expected. The, wor the worker can still perform in this case most duties but may suffer some lost time or wages. While temporary total disabilities are ones in which the worker is incapable of performing any work for a limited time but full recovery is expected. This category accounts for the majority of workers' compensation cases. The permanent partial disabilities are ones in which the worker will not fully recover from injuries but can still perform some work. In this category, accounts for the majority of workers' compensation costs and is further subdivided into schedule and non-schedule injuries. When we say schedule injuries, these are injuries receives a specific payment for a specified time according to a schedule, while a non-schedule injury is of less specific nature, such as disfigurement with payments prorated to a schedule injury. The last one is the permanent total disabilities. These are sufficiently serious that they will prevent the employee from ever working in regular employment. There may be consider considerable differences in what constitutes total disability, but in many states, this is accorded by the loss of sight in both eye or the loss of both arm or both legs. So, in approximately one half of the states, the compensation is for the duration of the disability of the injured worker's lifetime. The duration is limited to 500 weeks. In case of the worker's death, benefits are paid to the widow for life or until remarriage and to children until the age of 18 or until the maximum period of payments. So there may be some other important conditions depending on the states. In some cases, the companies may be able to require the injured worker to see a company physician and to perform suitable lighter duty employment. And if the worker refuses, workers' compensation benefits can be determined. Though in most cases, the workers' compensation are settled quickly and the worker receives a direct settlement. From the, uh, from the company's perspective, it is important to try to decrease workers' compensation costs as much as possible. So this can be done through a variety of means. Uh, first and foremost, implement a safety program so as to reduce workplace hazards and to train operators in the proper procedures. Second is to implement a proper medical management program. This means hiring a good occupational nurse and selecting a knowledgeable local physician to visit the plant and understand the various job. This will aid in proper diagnosis and the assignment of workers to light duty job. It is also very important to get the injured employees back to work as quick as possible, even if only a light duty job. 
Third is to review the employment classification of each employee based on the job she or he performs. It makes no sense to have a misclassification result in increased premiums. Like for example, an office worker misclassified as grinder operator. And for the fourth one is a con to conduct a prop a conduct a thorough payroll audit which is overtime is charged as straight time on workers' compensation. So therefore, double, double overtime wages, $20 an hour, would greatly inflate the company's cost compared to straight $10 an hour charges. The fifth is compare self-insurance and various insurance programs for the lowest cost and use deductible. The sixth is... Uh, Check your mood ratio frequently. This is the ratio of actual losses to losses expected of similar employers, with 1.00 being average. And by implementing a good safety program and reducing accidents, injuries, and consequently workers' compensation claims, this mood ratio will drop significantly. A mood ratio of 0 0.85 means a 15% savings on premiums through proper management, workers' compensation cost can be controlled. So part 7 tackles about the Occupational Safety and Health Administration or known as OSHA. So OSHA Act it is to assure so far as possible every working man and woman in the nation safe and healthful working conditions and to preserve our human resources. So this is the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 and was passed by the Congress. So under the Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration was created to First is to encourage employers and employees to reduce workplace hazards and to implement new or improving existing safety and health programs. Then, establish separate but dependent responsibilities and rights for employers and employees for the achievement of better safety and health condition. Next is to maintain a reporting a record keeping system to monitor job related injuries and illnesses. The, la uh, the next one is develop mandatory job safety and health standards and enforce them in effectively. The last one is to provide for the development, analysis, evaluation, and approval of state occupational safety and health programs. Since the act can intimately affect the design of the workplace, methods and analysts should be knowledgeable regarding the details of this act. So, the general duty clause of the act states that each employer must furnish place of employment which is free from recognized hazards that cause or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. Furthermore, the Act brings out that it is the employer's responsibility to become familiar with standards applicable to their establishments and to ensure the employees have and use personal protective gear and equipment for safety. Uh, the Act also requires employers of 11 or more employees to maintain records of occupational injuries and illnesses on the OSHA 300 log. An occupational illness and occupational injuries. An occupational injury is defined as any injury such as cut, fracture, sprain, or amputation which result from a work-related accident or from exposure involving a single incident in the work environment. While occupational illness is any abnormal condition or disorder other than one resulting from an, from an occupational injury caused by exposure to environmental factors associated with employment. 
So, the occupational illnesses include acute and chronic illnesses that may be caused by inhalation, absorption, ingestion, or direct contact with toxic substances or harmful agents. Specifically, they must be recorded if the result is death, loss of one or more work days, restriction in motion or ability to do the work that had been done, loss of consciousness, transfer to another job, or medical treatment and other first aid. So when we talk about workplace inspection, to enforce its standards, OSHA is authorized to conduct work workplace inspection. Every establishment covered by the Act is subject to inspection by OSHA Compliance Safety and Health Officer. So the Act states that upon presenting appropriate credentials to the owner, operator or agent in charge, an OSHA compliance officer is authorized to enter without delay any factory or workplace to inspect all the pertinent conditions, equipment, and materials therein and to question the employer, operator, or employees. So OSHA inspections with few exceptions are conducted without advance notice. In fact, Alerting an employer in advance of an OSHA inspection can bring a fine up to $1,000 and or 6-month jail term. Special circumstances under which OSHA may give notice or inspection to an employer include those who were First, is eminently dangerous Eminently dangerous Situations exist that requires correction as soon as possible. Second is inspection necessitate special preparation or must take place after regular business hours. Third is prior notice ensures that the employer and employee representative or other personnel will be present. Fourth is the OSHA area director determines that advance notice would produce a more thorough or more effective inspection. So upon inspection, if an Im imminently dangerous situation is found, the compliance officer asks the employer to abate the hazard voluntarily and to remove endangered employees from exposure. Notice one of the imminent danger must also be posted. Before the OSHA inspector leaves the workplace, he or she will advise all affected employees of the hazard. After the inspection tour, a closing conference is held between the compliance officer and the employer or the employer representative. The compliance officer reports the findings to OSHA office and area director determines what citations, if any, will be issued and what penalties, if any, will be proposed. Next is citation. What is citation? It is to inform the employer and employees of the regulations and standard alleged to have been violated and proposed time set for their abate abatement. The employer will receive citations and notices of proposed penalties by certified mail. Uh, the compliance officer has the authority to issue citations at to the work site following the closing conference. To do so, he or she must first discuss each apparent violation with the area director and must receive approval to the citations. So, the six types of violations that may, that may be cited and the penalties may be imposed are as follows. So, the first one is de minimis. De minimis means no penalty. This type of violation has no immediate relationship to safety or health, for example, number of toilets. The second one is the non-serious violation. So this violation has a direct relationship to job safety and health, but probably would not cause death or serious physical harm. A proposed penalty of up to $7,000 for each violation is decretionary. A penalty for a non-serious violation may be decreased considerably depending on the employer's good faith. Demonstrated efforts to comply with the act, history of previous violation, and size of business. 
The third one is the serious violation. This is a violation in which there is substantial probability that death or serious harm could result stemming from a hazard about which the employer knew or should have known. A mandatory penalty of up to $7,000 is assessed for each violation. The fourth one is the willful violation. This violation that the employ employer intentionally and knowingly commits. The employer either knows that his or her actions constitute a violation or is aware that a hazardous condition exists and has made no reasonable effort to eliminate it. So penalties up to $70,000 may be proposed for each willful violation. If an employer is convicted of a willful violation and has resulted in the death of an employee, there also may be imprisonment for up to six months. A second conviction doubles these maximum penalties. The fifth one is the repeated violation. A repeated violation occurs when a violation of any standard, regulation, rule, or order is re-inspected and another violation of the previously cited section is found. If on re-inspection, a violation of previously cited standard, regulation, rule, or order is found, but it involves another piece of equipment and or different location in the establishment or work site, it may be considered repeated violation. Each repeated violation can, be, can bring a $70,000. If there is a finding of guilt in criminal proceeding, then up to six months imprisonment and $250,000 fine for an individual or $500,000 fine for a corporation may be imposed. The sixth violation, type of violation, and the last one is the imminent danger. In this situation, there is reasonable certainty that danger exists that can be expected to cause death or serious physical normal enforcement procedures. An imminent danger violation may result in a cessation of the operation or even complete the plant shutdown. So there are also other violations for which citation and proposed penalties may be issued are as follows. So these are falsifying records, reports, or application and conviction can bring a fine of $10,000 and six months in jail. Second is violating the posting requirements can bring a civil penalty of up to $7,000. Third one is failing to abate or correct a violation can bring a civil penalty of $7,000 for each day. The violation continues beyond the prescribed abatement date. And lastly is assaulting, interfering with, or resisting an inspector in his or her duties can result in a fine of up to $5,000 and imprisonment up to 3 years. Lastly is the OSHA ergonomics program. In 1990, the high incidences and severity of work-related skeletal disorders found in the meatpacking industry lead OSHA to develop ergonomics guidelines to be used in protecting meatpackers from this hazard. This is according to OSHA 1990. So, this publication and dissemination of these guidelines were meant to be a first step in assessing the meatpacking industry in implementing a comprehensive safety and health program that would include ergonomics. So, the guidelines were meant to provide information so that the employers could determine if they have ergonomics type problems, identify nature and location of those problems, and implement measures to reduce or eliminate them. So, the, ergon the ergonomics program for meatpacking plants is divided into five sections. Namely, management commit commitment and employee involvement, worksite analysis, recommended hazard preventions and control, medical management, and training and education. Commitment and involvement are essential elements in any sound of safety and health program. 
commitment maybe management is especially important in providing both the motivating force and the necessary resources to solve the problems an, F an effective program should have a team approach with top management as a team leader using the following principles these are a written program for job safety health and ergonomics with clear goals and objectives to meet these goals endorsed and advocate by the highest levels of management next is a personal concern for employee health and safety emphasizing the elimination of ergonomic hazards third one is a policy that places the same emphasis on health and safety as on production fourth is the assignment and communication of the responsibility of the ergonomics program to the appropriate managers supervisors and employees the fifth one is a program ensuring accountability from these managers supervisors and employees for carrying it out the responsibilities and the last and the sixth one is the implementation of regular review and evaluation of the ergonomics program this might include trends analysis of injury data employee service before and after evaluation of workplace changes logs of job improvements and in chatera so also employees can be involved via the following first is a compliant or suggestion procedure for avoiding their concerns management without fear of reprisal next is a procedure for prompt and accurate recording of the first signs of work-related musculoskeletal disorders so that prompt controls and treatment can be implemented the third one is ergonomics committees that receive reports of analyze and correct ergonomics problems and lastly ergonomics teams with the required skills to identify and analyze jobs for ergonomic stress so an effective ergonomics program in includes four major elements these are worksite analysis hazard hazard control uh, proper medical management training and education worksite analysis identifies existing hazards and conditions as well as operations and workplaces where such hazard hazards may develop the analysis includes a detailed tracking and statistical analysis of injury and illness records to identify patterns of work-related musculoskeletal disorder development. Uh, the, the first step is to, for implementing the analysis program should be a review and analysis of medical records, insurance records, and OSHA 300 logs and using chi-square analysis. Next is the baseline screening surveys can be conducted to identify jobs that may employment employees at risk of developing work-related musculoskeletal disorders. Then a physical work site analysis can be conducted with a walkthrough of the plant and videotaping and analysis of critical jobs using the work design checklist and analysis tools presented. Uh, earlier chapters finally as in any methods program periodic reviews should be conducted this may uncover previously missed risk or uh, design deficiencies the second one is the hazard control involves the same engineering controls work practice controls personal protective equipment and administrative controls so engineering controls where feasible are the OSHA preferred method of control. The third one is the proper medical management, including the early identification of signs and the effective treatment of symptoms is necessary to reduce the risk of development, developing work-related musculoskeletal dis disorders. A physical or occupational nurse with experience in musculoskeletal disorders should supervise the program. The person should conduct periodic, systematic workplace walkthroughs to remain knowledgeable about the jobs, identify potential light duty jobs, and maintain close contact with employees. In this information, 
will allow the health providers to recommend an assignment of recovering workers' restricted duty jobs with minimal ergonomic stress on the injured muscle and tendon groups. Lastly is the training and education. These are critical components of an ergonomics program employees potentially exposed to ergonomics hazards. So training allows managers, supervisors, and employees to understand the ergonomics problems associated with their jobs as well as the prevention, control, and medical consequences of those problems. This includes general training on work related musculoskeletal disorder, risk factors, symptoms, and hazards, hazards associated with a job should be given annually to those employees who are potentially exposed. Next is job-specific training on tools, knives, guards, safety, and proper lifting should be given to new employees prior to their being placed in a full-time job. Third, is supervisors should be trained to recognize the early signs of work-related musculoskeletal disorders and hazardous work practices. Fourth, managers should be trained to be aware of their health and safety responsibility. And the fifth one, engineers should be trained in the prevention and correction of ergonomic hazards through workplace redesign. So to wrap this up, a rough draft version of guidelines for general industry as a precursor to an ergonomic standard was released in 1990 and the final version was signed early in 1992. It contained primarily the same information as found in the guidelines for the meatpacking industry. And there was considerable negative reaction from industry and with, and with the Republicans gaining control of Congress in 1992. The ergonomics standard was effectively shelved for the time being. So hazard control. This section presents the basic principles in controlling hazards. So first, let us differentiate the hazard from danger. So hazard. Hazard is a condition with the potential of causing injury or damage, while danger is the relative exposure to or potential consequences of that certain hazard. So for example, an unprotected worker on a scaffold is exposed to a hazard and has the danger of serious injury. But if the worker wears a safety harness, there is still a hazard, but the danger of the hazard has been reduced considerably since the worker is wearing a harness. Hazards can occur in several general categories. First is due to inherent properties such as high voltage, radiation, or caustic chemicals. Second is due to potential failure either on the operator or some other persons or the machine or some other equipment. And the third one is due to environmental forces or stresses, for example, as wind, corrosion, and etc. So general approach. General approach is to first completely eliminate the hazard and prevent the accident. But if not successful, the accident may still happen, but the potential injury or damage is minimized. Elimination of a hazard can be achieved through good design and proper procedures. So for the example is the use of non-combustible materials and solvents, rounding edges on the equipments and etc. So we can apply these things to remove the operator from the certain hazards on the environment. But if the hazard is cannot be eliminated, then the second effective way to control a hazard is to limit the hazard. An example of limiting the hazard is the use of governors on school bus to limit the maximum speed of vehicles. So if the hazard level cannot be limited, then another approach is applied, which is isolating the hazard. So the use of isolation, barriers, and interlocks to minimize the contact between the energy source and the human operator is that is another way of controlling a hazard. So the common isolation techniques are to create a contaminant-free booth either around the equipment or around the employee workstation. So interlock. 
Interlock is a more complex approach or device that prevents incompatible events from occurring at the wrong time. So the good example of an interlock is the previously mentioned example, which is the switch in the cover of a coffee mill to prevent the user or operator finger being in a ball at the same time that the switch is activated. So next, fail-safe designs. Fail-safe designs are systems that are designs that in case of failure, they go to the lowest energy level. But remember, a fail-safe system isn't designed to prevent failure, but it mitigates failure when it occurs. So meaning, they lessen the failure if ever it occurs. So one example of a fail-safe design is an elevator. Elevators are typically designed with special brakes that are held back by the tension of the elevator cable. So if the cable snaps, the loss of tension causes those brakes to be applied. So failure minimization. This approach decreases the probability of system failure. So you can minimize failures through increased reliability, safety factors, and monitoring. So finally, use of personal protective equipment. So personal protective equipment or PPE include gloves, glasses, earmuffs, aprons, safety footwear, dust masks, which are designed to reduce exposed to hazard. So those are the ways in controlling a hazard. So first, eliminate the hazard. Second, limit the energy level. Third, isolate the hazard. Third, designing a fail-safe equipment and systems. Fourth, minimizing the failures through increased reliability, safety factors, and monitoring. And lastly, the use of personal protective equipment. So, I'm gonna discuss about the last topic of Chapter 8. So, 8.9, the general housekeeping. So, what is general housekeeping? It is uh, general safety considerations related to the building. So it is include adequate floor loading capacity. So this topic especially important in such storage areas where loading may cause serious accidents. The danger signs of overloading includes the cracks in walls or ceilings. So excessive vibration and displacement of structural members. The aisles, stairs, and other walkways should be investigated periodically to ensure that they are free of obstacles, are not uneven, and are not covered with oil or other mga sticky or liquid materials that could lead to slips, to slips and falls. And many old buildings, stairs should be inspected since they are the cause of numerous lost time accidents or mga accidents that can cause the people or the workers to be um, injured so stairs should be have a slope of 28 or 35 degrees with thread width, width of 11 to 12 inches so basically it is a 28 to 35.5 cm and the racer heights of 66.5 to 7.5 inches 16.5 to 19 cm so all stairways should be equipped with handrails and should have at least 10 fc or 100 length times of illumination and it should be painted in light colors so the aisles so by the way the aisles there is a it's like a passage between row of seats in the building or mga such as like mga theater or mga sa store like that so the aisles should be plainly marked and straight with well rounded corners or diagonals at turn points if aisles are to are to accommodate vehicle travel they should be at least 3 feet wider than twice the width of the broadest vehicle so when it is when it is only one way then it should be two feet wider 
then the broadest vehicle is ad adequate. So in general, I should have at least 10 FC, 100 of illumination. So then the color should be used throughout to, in, in, to indicate or to identify hazardous condition. So here are the tables of the different colors to use. So in color red, it is used for fire protection, fire protection equipment, danger, and it is also used as a stop signal. So fire alarm box, so the example is fire alarm boxes, location of fire extinguishers and fire hose, sprinkler piping, uh, the safety can for flammables, mga danger signs and emergency stop buttons. So, in color orange, it is used for dangerous parts of machines and other hazards. Example is inside of movable guards, safety, starting buttons, edges of exposed parts of moving equipment. So, the third one is yellow. It is used for disseminating caution or physical hazards. So, for example, construction and material handling equipment, corner markings, edges of platforms, pits, stair threads, projections, and also black stripes or checks may be used in conjunction with yellow. So, in color green, it is used for safety. Example is location of first aid equipment, gas mask, safety delay showers. In color blue, it is used for designating caution against starting or using equipment. Against starting or using equipment. So, for example, mga warning flags at starting point of machines, electrical controls, and valves equipment about tanks and boilers. In color purple, it is used for radiation hazards. For example, container for the radioactive materials or sources. Lastly, color black and white. So it is used for traffic and housekeeping markings. For example, location of aisles, direction signs, clear for floor areas, around emergency equipment so so most machine tools can be satisfactorily guarded in order to minimize the probability of a worker being injured while while he or she operating the machine but the problem is that many older other machines are not properly guarded or it is misleaded so in these instances we should take an immediate action to see that a guard is provided and the and that is workable and routinely used so an an alternative approach is to provide or to use a two button operation so this is the example or in this picture, the two-way button operation machine. Mm -hmm. Note that the 200 buttons are spread well apart, as you can see in the picture, so that the operator hands, op operator's hands are in a safe position when the press starts so these buttons should not require higher levels of force or doesn't require as much as muscular effort to press that button otherwise repeti repetitive motion requires injuries are likely to occur so in fact newer buttons can be act activated through skin capacitance rather than relying on mechanical pressure or pressure or pressure in your in your arms or fingers when pressing the button 
a better alternative may be to automate the process or something like mga automatic machine like that so completely freeing the operator from the nip point or using a robotic yes the robotic manipulator in place of the operator so a quality control and maintenance system should be incorporated in the tool room and and the tool cribs so, so that only reliable tools in good working conditions are released to workers so so examples of unsafe tools that should not be released to operators it is include power tools with broken insulation mga electrical driven power tools lacking ground plugs or or wires then poorly sharpened tools and also hammers with mushroom heads and crack grinding wheels so mga grinding wheels without guards and tools with split handles or sprung jaws or like broken broken jaws something like that so these these are also potential dangerous materials and hazard hazard hazardous chemicals to be considered so these materials can cause variety of health and safety problems and it typically fall into one of three categories such as th this falls on three categories such as the corrosive materials toxic materials and the flammable materials so when we say corrosive materials it includes a variety of acid acids and caustics that can burn and destroy not only your skin but also the human tissue upon in contact so the chemical action of corrosive materials can take place by direct contact with the skin or throughout inhalation sa nose nimo of fumes or vapors so to avoid this kind of mga symptom mga problems or mga poten potential danger resulting the use of corrosive materials so this consider the following measures this for so first be sure that the material handling methods are completely foolproof so when you say foolproof it means simple or well-made well-made materials or made materials or it is or very reliable and surely guaranteed to use this kind of materials the second one is avoid any spilling or sputtering especially during during delivery process or when you work so it is so it is hardly avoided then the third one is be sure that operators exposed to corrosive materials have used and are using correctly designed personal protective equipment or mga protective gears that they can use in their work and also the, the waste disposal procedures so lastly to ensure that the dis dispensary or the first aid area is equipped with the necessary emergency provisions including the large showers and eye baths Toxic or irritating materials include la gases, liquids, or solids that poison, poison out the body or disrupt normal process by ingest, ingestion, absorption throughout the skin, or also in the inhalation. To control these toxic materials, so you can use these following methods. First is completely isolated the process. The process from workers second provide adequate exhaust ventilation the third one is provide workers with reliable personal yes personal protective equipment or protective gears 
to ensure that the workers are safety when doing their work. So the fourth one, or the last one is, is substitute a non-toxic or non-irritating material whenever it is possible. The, comp the composition of every chemical compound must be ascertained its hazard determined and appropriate control measures to establish the, pro the to establish to protect the employees. So this information must be clearly presented to workers with clearly labels and also the MSDS, MSDS or the Material Safety Data Sheets. The flammable materials and strong oxidizing agents present fire and explosion hazards. So the spontaneous ignition of combustible materials can take place when this is in insufficient ventilation to remove the heat from a process of slow oxidation. So to, to prevent this, such as fires, Combustible, combustible materials need to be stored well in a cold dry place area or mga place that it, it mga other places that it is safe so small quantities should be stored in covered metal containers so some combustible dust such as sawdust are not ordinarily known to be explosive so it is rather safe than the other materials that is flammable. However, explosions can occur when such dust are in a fine enough state to ignite. So, it is a must to avoid this kind of situation. So, to avoid explosions, prevent ignition by providing adequate ventilation exhaust systems and by controlling the manufacturing process to minimize the generation of dust and the liberation of gases and vapors. So the gases and vapors may be removed from gas streams by absorption in liquids or solids or cond condensation and catalytic combustion and incineration. So in absorption, the gas or vapor becomes distributed in the collecting liquid found in absorption towers such as the towers of um, having a bubble cap plate columns pack towers spray towers and wet silk washers so the absor absorption of gases and vapors uses a variety of solid absorbents such as the charcoal with an affinity for a certain substance, substances such as the benzene, carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, nitrous oxide, and the acetaldehyde. So in case the flammable materials ignite, suppression of the suppression of resulting fire so this occurs when when having this um, kind of chain reaction so maka cause na siya fire so simple principles of the fire triangle so these are required components such as the fire to a fire such as um, the oxygen or the oxidizer and chemical reactions second is the fuel or reducing agent and chemical reaction and lastly the heat or the ignition so when when this when this three presents in this kind of situation so maka chemical reaction mo maka cause si of fire so removable of any component will suppress the fire or or the collapse of the triangle so katotolo so so spraying of water on the house fire cools 
on a higher on a house fire cause the fire and also the dilutes the oxygen so so in this method we can lessen the fire or or such as using foam on fire or covering it with a blanket para ma remove oxygen from the fire so spreading out the logs in a camphor also it removes the fuel and minimize the fire so more practically in the plants there will be both both fi fixed extinguishing system such as on um, water sprinkles you can use the water sprinkles and also the portable fire extinguishers so this fire these fires categorized by types or these kinds of method categorized by types and sizes so these are the four basic types so so class a so class a which means the ordinary combustibles so you can use it can use whether the foam or basically only the water to put out the fire so it is simple and delicious gravity so the second is the class b for flammable liquids typically so mag use ng tag foam to to put out the fire so the third one is for the electrical equipment so we're gonna use about the non non-conductive foams and the fourth one is the cl class d for oxid oxidizable metals when we say oxidable metals these are metals that uh, that can easy, easily be put on fire so metals such as for example mga calcium gold zinc like that mga metals adali rin siya ma put into fire and lastly the class a which is the cooking cooking media or the kitchen kitchen area that is all for our discussion thank you